Yeah. Cool. Okay, um, we're going to make a reasonably prompt start. Often these events that we do, uh, we give a bit more leeway for people arriving. I know a few more people will be arriving later on. But tonight's a special occasion for us as we've got to leave pretty promptly just before half past six. Uh, the next two weeks, if you've got to the four <coughs> two ones, we've got a bit more time. But this one week, we've got a separate event we have to go to. Um, those of you who don't know me, my name is Guy Osborne. Um, I'm an academic in Westminster Law School. Um, to my right here is Robert Allen, and Robert's a great friend of the Law School. He's an associate fellow in our Centre for Law, Society and Popular Culture. And Robert's been doing events and things with the Law School for three or four years now. And um, this has become a bit of an annual series where Robert will come in and talk about contracts. And he started off just coming in and Robert would do a session. And suddenly he said, well, actually, that's not enough time for me. That's not, I don't just need to do publishing, I need to do recording contracts. I need to do management contracts. You'd probably want to do even more contracts if you could, wouldn't you? He, he loves doing it. <laughs> don't know and, any um, more contracts. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think Robert's sort of, um, you will have read about Robert's background on the website, so I won't go into that um, in any detail. But suffice to say, um, I see him as the <coughs> one of the godfathers of entertainment law, one of the people that started entertainment law. Me and James Brown. <laughs> And um, you know, we, we're just delighted that Robert's uh, given us a lot of his valuable time with us over the last few years to do events like this. Uh, so without further ado, I'll pass you over to him. As I say, today is slightly truncated, so apologies for that. But there's an another event that a number of you may be going to, a music tank event over in Regent Street with one of our other LLM entertainment law students giving a paper. So we've got to go for that as well. But um, over to Robert to tell us all you ever wanted to know, but we're afraid to ask about publishing contracts. <sighs> Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I, all, you're all new faces to me because I do this only once a year, and so you, you know, the last year's crop have moved on. Um, I don't speak to notes. I mean, I don't read notes. Those are my notes on today. That's it. That's so. It's what comes out is I don't know what's going to come out until it comes out, and that's the way I like to do it. The subject tonight is about publishing contracts music publishing contracts, to be more precise. I'm going to look at those from the writer's perspective, not from the publisher's perspective. Um, and I'm also going to ask you to try and hold this kind of all the way through this topic, which is we're talking here about songs and the copyright in songs. We're not talking here about the copyright in the recording of songs, which is a separate copyright. I'm assuming that you've all done so a certain amount of legal study and a certain amount of studying of the copyright legislation in this country and possibly elsewhere. So I'm differentiating. There is a separate copyright in recording of songs, but this is about the copyright in the song itself. And the period of copyright for a song is the life of the author, or if more than one author, the last of the authors to die, plus 70 years. And that period applies in most every country in the world, except for the USA, which has some very weird and wonderful propositions. And I'm not here to lecture on US law or US copyright law, so I'll leave you to kind of explore that avenue yourselves if you feel you want to. So that's the background. Why, what is a publisher? What does he do for a living? And why do you need one are the sort of first central questions. Assuming that you're all going to go on to become lawyers and you're all going to therefore have clients who are going to be asking you these kind of you know, fairly basic questions. Well, these days the answer to what does a publisher do is actually not very much. Um, there was a time when, if you go back in history, publishers came up at the time, uh, came into being as a business in the sort of late 19th century uh, when sheet music was popular. And essentially what they did was they got the rights to the sheet music and they sold it to p members of the public for however much you could sell sheet music for in those days. And the public took it home and put it on their pianos and played away merrily to the sheet music or sung to it or whatever. <coughs> that, it was a small, as you can imagine, a pretty small fry business in those days. And that didn't change greatly until, I suspect really, the advent of, of 
talky movies and and sound recordings that you buy in a you know in disc form rather than in all sorts of weird wonderful contraptions that, that existed for sound recordings before that time. So really, the business of publishing gets moving, gets become starts to become a real industry. Uh, I suppose in about the 20s or the 1920s, 1930s and becomes very much larger, of course, as r records start selling in vast quantities, as they did from about the 1960s, late 50s, 1960s onwards. The advent of rock and roll is really the, the making of the publishing industry. And it's an industry that has known how to survive hard times, and is, if you look at the various music business industries, that there are record companies and all of the other businesses that are within the music industry, Publishers have done fairly well. They've had a dip, but they, by and large, as one source of income kind of dries up or slows down, other sources of income tend to multiply and, and produce the difference between what they used to get and what they now get. So what do they do and why do you need one? They used to, when they were creative and when they all lived in um, Tin Pan Alley, which is a small street not very far away from here, or na nickname of a small street not far away from here, th th their primary motivation in those days was A, to collect money that the song that they, were pu the, that they were publishing was earning, but B, to try and increase the ways of earning money from that song, particularly by getting cover recordings. In the days I'm talking about, which is sort of the pre-Beatles days, the sort of 19, mid-1950s up to about 1963, there were two classes of people in the music industry. There were performers who rarely, if ever, wrote their own material, and there were songwriters who rarely, if ever, recorded their material. So the business of a publisher was to take songs written by their writer clients and to try and find recording artists who would record the song and therefore generate income from that song. Uh, the, the Beatles have a lot to answer for in a lot of ways, and I, I'm a huge fan, so I'm not going to sit here and criticize them, except to say that they gave credence to a, an idea which I don't think really holds true anymore, which is if you're an enormously talented songwriter or songwriters like Lennon and McCartney, you could write a whole album's worth of material and it would all be of equal, you know, pretty equal standard and pretty fabulous standard. And they, they kind of led everybody else to believe that if, they, if the Beatles could do it, so can we. And the number of artists that have attempted over the years to write an album's worth of material for you only to like two tracks and the other tracks are just filler, is legendary within the music business. Um, and of course, since uh, by and large artists were recording their own, write, their own written material, the job of a publisher in trying to find covers lessened considerably because the artist was actually recording his own material. And therefore not so much need to go out and find a cover version of, 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 of that particular recording. Having said, I don't, th so they don't do that much anymore. They still collect the money and the better publishers, um, and I'm not going to name names and point fingers, but the better publishers have good creative teams such as will help you decide which of your material should be recorded and which perhaps is a bit of a waste of time, will help by trying to go to film companies and TV companies and get sync licenses. I'll explain what those are in a minute. Um, and, and therefore increase the income from that, uh, that way. And particularly if you're, a, if you're a writer who's also a performer but you haven't yet got a recording contract or a way of getting your recordings to the public, they will help. Uh, it's in their interest to do so. The more, that they can the more income they can generate from the songs that they are looking after for you, the more income for them, as well as the more income for you. So they, they are motivated, the best of them, to try and do a kind of creative job for you. But a lot of them just sit there and simply collect them, allow, the, allow you know, events to take their course and collect the money as a result of those events happening. Uh, having said that, which is all sounds fairly negative about what publishers do, do you need one? Yes, I think you do. If you're, if you're, if, unless you're a, a, a successful 
band, singer-songwriter, whatever, who's got the kind of money that is necessary to uh, have an office, employ people to deal with this stuff on your behalf, which very few bands have ever wanted, even if they've had the money to do it. Beatles, again, are an exception, or McCartney in particular is an exception. Runs his own publishing company, buys other people's publishing rights, etc. But they're very few and far between. And it, and it takes a, you know, you have to hire the right people and you have to pay them ex exceptionally good salaries for doing what they're doing. So most uh, people don't opt for that course and therefore they hire a publisher to do the things that they could perhaps do by employing people to do it instead of hiring outside people to do it. Do you need one? Well, you could join every single collection society in the world, of which there are hundreds, and by doing that with a bit of luck, you might collect in all the income wherever it's being earned, because it's being earned all around the world on successful songs. And you might just get away with doing that. It's incredibly difficult to do. A, to join them is tough in a lot of places. B, to interpret the royalty statements that you get from them is difficult to do. And C, you know, if you're a singer-songwriter or just a songwriter, you probably don't have the kind of brain that goes with looking at royalty statements. It, in my experience, they tend to be antithetical. If you, can, if you can play a guitar, you don't really like reading royalty statements. If you like reading royalty statements, like me, you can't play a guitar. You know, it's, they, they, they don't go hand in glove with each other. So unless you're going to hire in, as I say, a whole raft of people at your own expense to do this work on your behalf, do you need a publisher? Yes, you probably do. They're going to ensure that you make as much money out of your songs as is possible to make, because they're, they're going to get a share of it, as we'll see. <coughs> the main sources of income for any song, and there are a number of different sources, and there are a lot of subsidiary small fry income sources, but the main three are performance income. That is the income that anybody performing your song in public has to pay for the ability to be able to perform your song in public. Um, and although that applies to bars and clubs and shops and or, you know, going up with stadiums and, and concert halls and etc., really the big money there is broadcast income because that's a public performance. Every time the song is played on the radio, every time it's played on TV, that's a public performance of the song. And the Performing Rights Society, which is the performance society for this country, to which nearly every single songwriter in this country is a member, collects that income from the various sources, the stadiums, the shops, the bars, the pubs, etc. but in particular, from the big broadcasters, the big radio broadcasters and the big TV broadcasters. And that brings in a great deal of money per year. And if you looked at it these days, that's probably about 60% of a publisher's income or of a, of a typical song, 60% of the income is going to come from performance income. The, the second biggest is called mechanical royalties, and people get really screwed up with this terminology because it goes back to pre-disc recordings where, where they were sort of mechanical devices that went round in circles and th things like that, and that name stuck then. And, but it's essentially that part of the selling price of a record or that part of the selling price of a download uh, which is payable by the record company, the iTunes, etc., of this world, for the right to mechanically copy the song onto a sound recording. So this, this royalty is paid, this stream of income is paid by the people who make sound recordings and put them out into the world. And for every, every recording that they make, or every copy of every recording that they make, and it's slightly obviously different with downloads because it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an amount per play, but I'm talking about old-fashioned CD-type records. Um, a, the, a share of the selling price of each CD record is payable by the record company to the publisher for the right to be able to have that song on that recording differentiating again, as I have been from day one, 
from between the copyright in a song and the copyright in a sound recording of that song. Um, that probably accounts for these days probably something like 25% of the overall income. It used to be the number one earner. When, when CDs pre-downloading, pre-internet, when CDs were, and the previous versions of CDs, vinyl, etc., etc., were selling in massive quantities, the, the mechanicals were probably generating 60 to 65 percent of the income. But with the, with the loss of sales of CD and other forms of hard sound recordings, that, that has declined considerably and has not yet been replaced by the amount of money that record companies are earning from the iTunes of this world, the, the, the download operations in this world, mainly because still a vast quantity of those downloading operations are free. They are rip-offs. They don't pay any royalties to anybody. And, you know, if you can get it for free, still, why, you know, still these days, why are you going to pay for it if you can get it for free somewhere on the net? So that income has declined. But, as I say, the performance income has marched up steadily as the mechanical income has gone down. The third form of, of, of of well, the third source, major source of income is what are called sync or synchronization licenses. And these are licenses granted by the publisher or the owner of the copyright in the song to film companies to incorporate the music in the film or to TV ad, uh, ads to incorporate the music into a TV ad or into a TV series. Or any time there's, com there's a combination of sound and visual, moving visual, uh, th that requires a license from the owner of the copyright, and that is called a sync license. And that income is building hugely. It's up to about 15% of the overall and has come from maybe single digits in the last 10 years. That's a big future earner because there's a vast amount of television out there now. I mean, nearly all television channels in nearly all countries in the world broadcast 24 hours a day. That requires a lot of filling. That requires a lot of programs. That requires a lot of programs that feature music. And I'm not just talking about music programs. I mean, you know, the theme music to, you know, some TV series is also earning money for whoever wrote the theme music for that TV series. <coughs> the, I'm going to try and connect those sources of income back to a, 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 what, what a typical songwriter agreement does. So I'm moving from the sort of generic background of what publishers do, where their money comes from, etc., to, and we've got through why do you need one, and why should you have one, to the actual agreement that you, a writer, will do with a publishing company. And those have gone, those agreements have gone through a lot of changes in the course of my career. I'm a retired guy now. I don't uh, practice anymore, but uh, up until 2012, I think I'd been practicing for something like 45 years. And in those 45 years, the nature of publishing agreements had changed completely. In the days when I started, when, frankly, lawyers didn't understand what publishing agreements were, or what they did, or how they did it, publishing has always wrapped itself up in this kind of little mysterious cloak. You, you don't really understand what we do, and we're not going to tell you, and you know, you'll just have to hope that you know, we're going to treat you fairly. Well, in those days, they didn't treat you terribly fairly. First of all, they took an assignment of copyright, which meant that from the, the moment that you signed up to a publisher, you no longer owned your own songs. Anything that you wrote during the term of this publishing agreement would belong, the copyright in which would belong to the publisher for the whole life of copyright. And all you got was a share of the income generated by the songs that you wrote during that contract. And in those days, the share of income was 50%, the, the publisher retaining 50%, the writer getting 50%. And this is a key phrase, and I'll come back to it when I try to explain a little more about royalty shares in, later on today. It was 50-50 of uh, publish, what, what are called publisher's receipts. Remember the term publisher's receipts. I'm going to compare it to something else. So uh, um, publisher's receipts meant that, and this, this came out in the famous case of Schroeder and Macaulay, which went all the way to the House of Lords, 
and established new law in the UK. Um, publisher's receipts meant that if you signed, as Macaulay did, to a company called Schroeder, on this 50-50 of publisher's receipts basis and for life of copyright, Schroeder had a company in the, in the UK called Schroeder Music Limited, perfectly normal. It also had other companies in virtually all the other territories in the world and a clearinghouse company in Holland. So outside everything that it, everything that it signed up to, every song that it got from its publishing deals with writers, was outside of the United Kingdom, was sub-published for the rest of the world to Schroeder Music Holland. And Schroeder Music Holland then sub-sub-published to individual countries outside of Holland. Um, let's say the USA, for example, where there was a Schroeder Music Inc. So for every hundred dollars earned by a song in the USA, 50, all these deals were done on a 50-50 basis. Um, for every hundred dollars earned in the USA, fifty dollars was retained by Schroeder Music Inc. The other fifty dollars went back to Schroeder Music Holland, who retained twenty-five dollars, fifty-fifty, and passed on the twenty-five remaining dollars to Schroeder Music Limited, who then split that with the writer, so that the writer ended up with twelve and a half percent of the source one hundred dollars. Um, it wasn't illegal, and in fact, if you read Schroeder and Macaulay, the judges specifically say at some point, you know, this is what it meant, you signed it, you were over the age of consent, nobody jacked your arm up behind your back and said, made you sign it. So we can't find, we're not gonna find that this is an illegal practice, commercial practice. May not be the best commercial practice in the world, but there's nothing wrong with it. And they found against the contract for all sorts of other reasons, which I urge you to look at if you ever got the time. Having said that, that was how a 50-50 life of copyright based on publisher's receipts, publisher's receipts being the publishing company that you signed to, based on its receipts, that's how they worked. These days, a, a typical songwriter agreement looks this different. Number one, no writer ever gives the publishing company a life of copyright assignment. It just doesn't happen anymore. It's not illegal, but it just doesn't happen anymore. Very few publishers would even dream of, or have the temerity, indeed, to ask for that, such a thing, let alone um, actually get it. So what you do these days is instead of assigning for life of copyright, you assign for a fixed, ter a fixed term, which is usually the term of the contract, the exclusivity period of the contract, the number of years that you're signed to this publishing company during which, you, when you, if you write, the publishing company gets rights to the songs. That's, let's say, for, for argument's sake, that that's a five-year term contract. And then for probably five or ten years following the end of the five-year term, so a total period of maybe 10 to 15 years, at the end of which the publisher's rights have expired and the song becomes yours all over again, and given that the life of the copyright in a song is the life, your life plus 70 years, that's a very right, valuable right to get back. So life of copyright as a, an assignment just doesn't exist in this country and almost nowhere else in the, in the world either at this point. Much shorter term and therefore the right after X number of years to gather your song back and do something else with it rather than leaving it with the publisher who's got it for the rest of your life. <coughs> also, the 50-50 of publisher's receipts has gone completely um, um, away. The minimum, really, these days for a brand new songwriter is going to be 75-25 in favour of the songwriter. And the more successful the songwriter, the larger the 75 becomes. 80, 85, 90-10. There are 95-5 deals out there. There are even a few 100% to zero deals why, you may ask. I'll try and explain if we've got the time. Um, but typically, if, if you're a brand new writer, you're going to be looking for at least 75, 25 as a split. And you're going to want to split based on source receipts, which is the opposite, diametrically opposed opposite to publisher's receipts. So in the example I gave you about the $100 being earned in America, 
the hundred dollars is the source receipt. So you're saying, actually, I want 75% of the hundred dollars. I don't want 50% of, of $25 or whatever it was, 12.5%. I don't want a net 12.5%. I actually want a net 75%. And that's tending to be what you get these days. As I say, the more successful you are, the, the more the more in demand you are, the more there's a bidding war for your services, the more you're going to ask for more than 75%. But that's a, a, at least a good basis from which to start. So this, this new form of publishing agreement doesn't, and I repeat, does not grant a life of copyright assignment to the publisher, only grants him a term, a relatively short term compared to what life plus 70, and, and can either be by way of assignment, you, in other words, you can assign for a period that is less than the fear, period of copyright, and most publishers will want an assignment. You, as a writer, will probably want to grant them a license, because a license is more easily terminable than an assignment for a fixed period. And if you can get away with it, um, and you can find reasons to say you breached the terms of the license, etc., and I'm terminating the license, that's a much easier thing to do than to say, actually, I'm going to terminate the assignment for a fixed term. Much more difficult to do. So if you can, you're going to try and do a license rather than an assignment. Um, the, what, are you, what, are you, what is the subject matter of this agreement? It is going to be, in respect of songs that you have either already written prior to the beginning of the term, but have not committed elsewhere, plus whatever you write during the term of the agreement. Um, and that comes with a number of, of, of issues, because first of all, you've got to figure out what the term of the agreement is, and you've got to figure out what the product commitment is during the course of this term. Um, the term, let me, let me try and distinguish the term by calling it the exclusivity period. What I mean by the term is the period during which you are signed up to a publisher in which you may not, in fact, have other publishers publish your music for you. Or, or enter into any other agreement with another publisher. You have an exclusive term during which you can only write for this particular publisher. Um, that is generally expressed as an initial period with options always in the publisher's favour, never in the writer's favour. In the whole history of my career, have I ever seen the option in the writer's favour? To, with the publisher's uh, 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 favour to extend the, the initial period to a first option period, a second option period, a third option period. Typically, there would be five option periods in this contract. The initial period and four one-year options. And you would think that, therefore, that contract period is a solid five-year period, assuming all the options are exercised. But actually, that doesn't happen either, for reasons I'll come to in a minute. But let's call this, just for argument's simplicity's sake, a five-year term. Therefore, everything you write during that term equals ex exclusivity period. This publisher gets to publish, the one, the, the one you've done the contract with, and you can't go anywhere else during that time. Um, the problem is with that simplicity that I've just outlined as a five-year period is that during each contract period, the initial period and the option periods, you will, you have, you will have committed to a, a writing commitment, what's called a product commitment. How, you, know, you can't just take the money and sit there and actually not write. I mean, that's, you know, that's not what the bargain is about. So the publisher will say to you, actually, I want you to write X number of, of songs during the course of each contract period. And I don't want this contract period to come to an end until you've satisfied that obligation. <coughs> so the typical 
uh, uh, commitment for this world that we now live in is probably an album's worth of material written, recorded, and released. Because we're going to assume, for the purposes of this transaction, that we're talking about a singer-songwriter or a member of a band that records its own material. The publisher is wanting to say, in return for the money I'm going to pay you, the advances of the royalties I'm going to pay you, I want you to commit to writing one album's worth of material per, per contract period. And to the extent that you uh, don't write that within the contract period, then the contract period keeps going until you do write that. Now, the problem with that, and was very easy to point out to publishers, was actually that doesn't account, that doesn't account for writers who have a writer's block or who simply you know, got, or got ill or couldn't write or for all sorts of myriad reasons couldn't write the amount of material required for the, for, the, uh, for, the, for the contract period concerned. What do you do then? I mean, is he under contract for the rest of his life because he simply can't make the product commitment for the contract period? So you can't have an ever-extending contract. The English law doesn't allow a contract that goes on in perpetuity. And, and practitioners got over it by simply saying, OK, you can have an extension, but we're going to put a cap on the extension so that no one-year contract period can, in fact, be more than, let's typically say, three years. At the end of three years, shit or bust. You either got to take up your option and move on, or you drop the artist and you don't, you don't go on. But that three years, that one year could turn into three years, a maximum of three years. So this five-year term that I was talking about could, in the end, turn out to be a 15-year term. It doesn't happen like that very often because writers don't dry up uh, as frequently as you might think that they do. Um, sometimes they get into dispute with the publishers and don't want to actually deliver them any more material, but that's a kind of different, different story. Um, but very rarely do you get the one year you almost never get to the three years, but very rarely do you get the one year. Because in, in one year, you've got to write, record, and get released. And probably the release commitment is your obligation is to cause the record to be released in major markets like the UK, the USA, <coughs> France, Germany, Japan, places like that. You don't necessarily, you the writer, don't necessarily have control over <coughs> when and where your record company releases your recordings. So you might be, and in any event, gone are the days when writers wrote an album a year. Gone are the days when the Beatles came out with two albums in one year. These, this doesn't happen anymore. If you've got a successful album out there, it's going to be maybe three years before you record another one because you're too busy touring and, and promoting the, the record that's happening. <coughs> so. I would estimate that the one-year term generally turns out to be more like a two-year term. And, then, and therefore, if there are five, four option periods, initial and four option periods, that five-year period generally turns out to be more like 10 years. And then what are, you, what are you assigning or licensing? You're licensing for the term, the exclusivity period, plus a period of years at the end of the exclusivity period typically these days, five or 10 years. And that period, to distinguish from the exclusivity period, I'll call the exploitation period. So the, the, the songs the publisher gets are the songs written during the exclusivity period. The, 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 the publisher's right to exploit those songs lasts for the exclusivity period, plus this five or 10 years extension, which altogether I will call the exploitation period. So if you've given a 10-year exploitation period, term plus 10 years, the term, as I've just explained, might very well go on for 10 years. And then there's a further 10 years. So for 20 years, this publisher gets exclusively to look after the songs that you wrote in the 10-year term. I hope that's clear, because it screws up any number of people and any number of students that I've had in law firms, you know, trainees, et cetera, have sat and scratched their heads for weeks on end about trying to figure out the difference between those two periods. And that's as simple as I know how to explain it. If it's not clear, 
we probably won't get to a Q&A today, but if we get, we're, next time we'll have plenty of time for Q&A, and if it's still not clear by the next week when I do the next one, I'm perfectly happy to come back and try and explain it again. But I hope that you've got enough of it for, to, to, to make you understand. <coughs> Excuse me. So, the, we've got through the, that, that exploitation period in the music business, incidentally, is called the retention period. So there's all these terms, terminologies floating around that you know, are various and sundry and all turn out to mean the same thing. The term of the contract generally means the term of the contract, generally means the exclusivity period. The retention period is what I've been calling today the exploitation period, i.e. it's the period after the end of the exclusivity exclusivity period that the publisher still has rights. But not, any, not in anything that's written during that exploitation period, only the songs that were written during the exclusivity period. <laughs> Have I completely confused you? Um, the next point in the contract to argue about will be the territory. Uh, if you are a basically new songwriter, you're probably going to do a worldwide deal. You're not going to start drifting away and carving up the world into segments and doing different deals with different publishers. Because it's difficult enough to figure out what one publisher is doing for you, let alone different publishers in different territories. But as you become more sophisticated and more successful, you will come to realize that there are very few publishing companies that are great in all of the major territories. Different publishing companies are better in different territories. So at some point, probably not your first deal, you might decide to break up the world into more manageable chunks. And typically you would think you're UK, because this is where you're based, one publisher, possibly a different publisher for the rest of Europe, possibly a different publisher for North, North America, Canada, US and Canada, possibly a different publisher for South America, possibly a different publisher for the Far East, you can, split, you can split the world up into however many countries there are. You, I think there are 192 countries or something, and you can have 192 different deals. It would you'd be mental to try, but you might in fact decide that you could split the world up into five chunks and do five different deals with five different sets of publishers. And I wouldn't uh, discourage you from doing that. I would say, however, that you really need to be quite successful in order to be able to have a good enough accountants and lawyers to be able to do the deals for you and to interpret the royalty statements that you get when, once you start getting them. You know, simple at this stage in your career when you're new to have one publisher you know, that operates on a worldwide basis and gives you one royalty statement and you don't have to run around playing with that. Um, so, uh, we'll move on to the things that seem to fascinate most all of the writers that you will ever represent, and that's the money. Um, the money splits into two forms. There are what are called advances, and there are what are called royalty shares, or royalties. Let's deal with the royalties first, because they're, they tie back into those sources of income that I was talking about, performance, mechanical, sync. Um, and let's assume that we're doing a 75-25 deal here. On performance income, the income is going to be collected by the PRS and its sister organizations around the world. So all that money is going to flow in through the PRS. PRS rules say that the writer must be paid at least 50% of PRS receipts by PRS. So the writer is going to get 50% of, of the performance income directly from PRS. The other 50% goes to the publisher. And let us assume that you've done a 75-25 deal with the publisher. The publisher is then going to pay you a half of the publisher's income so that you're getting 50% from the PRS Direct and you're getting 25% from the publisher. And the issue about that is because when we get to advances, you will see that they are recoupable 
and the sources of recoupment are only the royalty streams. And since 50% of the PRS royalty stream is coming directly to your back pocket, that 50% is not usable by the publisher to recoup the advances that he's paid you. Um, and, and, and therefore an important distinction. Mechanical royalties are collected in this country by the MCPS, Mechanical Copyright Protection Society, but that is a, a publisher-owned organization. So all of the receipts that it gets, it pays to its publisher members, and uh, the publisher therefore pays you a share of the hopefully 100% that it's getting. It never does get 100% because there are costs of collection. So the costs of collection at MCPS are probably about 5 or 6%. So in the end, the publisher only gets about 94%, but you get 75% of that 94%. And the sinks, there is no collection society. That's dealt with by the publisher direct. The publisher goes out, finds TV companies, or TV companies find the publisher, or broadcasters, filmmakers, whoever, and uh, that income is collected directly by the publisher from the license granted by the publisher direct to the film company, TV company, TV advertiser, whatever. And that money, as I say, comes direct to the publisher and it's then split 75% in your favor, 25% to the, the retained by the publisher. There are usually provisions in the agreement that call for a larger share of the income to be paid based on a larger share, sorry, of the income to be retained by the publisher um, in the case of what are called cover recordings. So the publisher actually, in addition to your own recording of your own song, the publisher goes out and finds other song, other writers who are wanting to record the same song, and that in increases the income stream on that song, and therefore the publisher would say, I've done, I've done more work, I'm entitled to a larger share than 25%, and typically the split would be 60-40 on cover income. 60% to the writer, of course, 40% to the publisher, upping his share from 25% to 40%. <coughs> There are also ways in which the royalty increases, the royalty share to the writer increases, and that is typically done on a kind of time basis or a success basis. So, for example, the royalty share, which we said was 75, 25, may apply for, let's say, let's say the initial period, the initial contract period, songs written during the initial contract period, and songs written perhaps during the first option period. In the songs written during the second and third option period, that split might increase to 80-20. And if you get as far as the fifth option period, it is because you are enormously successful, right? Publishers are not about to ex you know, exercise options again and again in respect of writers who are not happening. So if they get to the, their last option period, you can assume that you have a really large career at this point, and you might be saying, all right, I now want 85-15 uh, for songs written during the fifth and f final period of this contract. Um, that's, those are called royalty escalations. But they only apply, those royalties apply always to the song, to the period during which the song is written. So the songs that are written in the first contract period and the first option period are always going to be at 75-25. That's not going to change. But it's, the, it's when the song was written that defines what the royalty is going to be under these escalating things. <coughs> the, the term advance is possibly the most misunderstood word in the music industry. Um, it's not a loan. So uh, you, you, typically, you're a, new, a brand new writer. You're looking for an advance. You're looking for an advance on signature of the contract. You're looking at an advance possibly during for each contract period, each subsequent contract period in the in, in the contract. So if it's a five five period contract period, you're looking for five different advances. You're probably going to get paid them. Um, a certain amount at the beginning of the contract period on signature, therefore, for the first contract period, 
upon exercise of option from the subsequent contract periods, but you're not going to get the whole advance for that period simply at the beginning of the period. The publisher is going to say, I, I, want, to, I want to spread the, the advances over the period by giving you something at the beginning of the period, something when you go into the studio to record your product commitment for the contract period in question, and uh, the last tranche when you've actually satisfied the re recording and release commitment and it's been released in the various territories that the contract says it's got to be released in. But if you're, a, a, and, and the advances would tend to build so that the advance that you get for the initial period, you would want a slightly larger advance for the first option period and then assuming that you've got to the second, third and fourth periods of the contract, you probably want incre increasingly larger advances because you're increasingly successful. If you're not increasingly successful, you're not going to get to those periods in the first place because the publisher is going to take the options up. But assuming that you are successful, you're going to want to, that success to be recognised by getting larger advances as well as, we, as we've just discussed, larger royalties. So what is it about advances that turns, turns out to be incredibly confusing? Well, it's very simply this. This is not a gift by the publisher to you. It is not a loan by the publisher to you. If the publisher pays you advances, you do not owe him the money back. Actually, what you do is you allow him to recoup the money from your royalty shares. And therefore, to a, to a great degree, the amount of the advances is, is risk money to the publisher. And you need to recognise that this is risk money because if you, do, if you, if you, he gives you, let's say you're a brand new writer, and you're looking for a fifty thousand pound initial advance, that's completely risk money to the publisher. You may never write a song that produces anything like fifty thousand pounds worth of income. But the first, 50, if he pays you the fifty thousand pounds, and as I say, that would normally be spread over tranches during the contract period. But let's assume that you've been paid the fifty thousand pounds. What that means is you don't get any royalties out of this publisher until the royalties have been used, your royalties have been used, to recoup the £50,000. So the first £50,000 of royalties due to you, you don't actually get. And the publisher takes that to recoup the 50000 that he's fronted you. And that's the only way that the publisher can get the money back. It can't sue you for return of the money. It's always expressed to be a non-returnable but recoupable advance of blah, 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 recoupable from royalties, blah, blah, blah. Um, I've never been, I've represented uh, a, um, a ton of, over the course of my career, a ton of incredibly successful songwriters and bands, etc., etc. World wide successes, huge sales, blah, blah, blah. I've never been the kind of lawyer that said, go for the advance. Certainly not to uh, uh, the, you know, the early, the, the, the greenhorn bands. But taking a big advance, which you can get if you, if you want to play the game and negotiate hard, you can get the 50,000 advance could quite easily become a 250,000 advance. If you play the game, you're going to have to trade royalty points to get to that point, which I never think is a good idea, because the royalties will last for a lot longer than the advances do. And you don't get any more income until those, those advances have been recouped. So, uh, and the tendency for bands, in my experience, has been to take the big fat royalty uh, uh, advance check, and in the words, I think, of a Springsteen song, the record company just gave me a big advance, and they spend it. They spend it on things that, you know, good or bad or indifferent things. That's the way people spend money. They spend it on, on, on technical equipment. They spend it on hookers. They spend it on booze. They spend it on drugs. They spend it on their mums. They spend it on whatever they spend it on. You know, look around 10 minutes later, and the 250 grand's disappeared. And you aren't going to get any more money out of the publisher until the publishers recoup the 250 grand. So you spent the money unwisely and, and tends to be what artists do. And then there's no more royalty income coming in for some time to come until, you know, you've recouped the advance and you're on royalty stream again, at which point you do another spending spree and you're forever in the hole. 
I've always been a, a huge advocate of take the minimum amount of advance that you can get, that you, that is, you, you can live with, but, but is also an amount that obliges the publisher to do something on your behalf, because if he doesn't, he's not going to get back the advance that he paid out. So it's a, it's a, it's a fine line between taking too much and taking too little. Uh, you want enough to commit the publisher to, to work, to treating you as an important writer and you know, needing to work hard on your behalf to get the money back. Um, on the other hand, you don't want to take so much that you're in di forever in the hole and never really recoup and never really get royalty statements and, 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 and royalty income. It's not always been um, an easy task to persuade clients to take that position. There are, I have represented clients who were only interested in the money. Fortunately, not that many. Most of them care more about their children. These songs are children to these writers. They're my kids. I wrote these in great pain or great, or I just wrote it on a train in two minutes, but that, these are my kids. I, I, and, I, and I don't see the difference between the one that was successful and the one that wasn't. They're all cherished and I love them and they're my, the outpourings of my soul. Writers could get very precious. Um, but, 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 and I understand that, you know, if that's what you do for a living, this is what you create and th your creations are really important to you. Um, so, not that many of them have said, you know, I want the big, I want the big royalty check. Most of them have understood that they want their songs well treated, they want them well exploited, and they want to get them back into their own back pockets as fast as they can, consistent with doing the shortest term deal possible. And 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 if that means you've got to trade away something in terms of how much how much uh, advances you get, then so be it. Also, there is a, a quid pro quo. The, the, the heavier the advance you ask for, the less you, ha you can negotiate the royalty share. If you're going to take the 250,000 pound advance, you are definitely not going to get better than 75, 25. If you take 50,000 instead of 250,000, you might be able to make that 75 into 85 or 80. And I think that's much more important because those royalty statements are going to come in from, as we looked at, probably the next 20 years. And I care about the next 20 years with an income more than I care about a fat royalty check today. Um, conscious I am of the time, I will zip into a few last minute provisions that I think are worth thinking about and understanding. First of all, I pointed out to you the difference between a license and an, 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 an assignment for short term, a short term assignment. One of the significant differences at law is that an assignment assigns, even if it's for short term, for the period of that assignment, it assigns all rights in the song, all copyright rights and analogous rights to the publisher, which means the publisher can use those rights and there is no limitation on what he can or cannot do with those songs, unless you put into the contract that you can't do the following things without my previous written consent. And that would be typically, I don't want my films, I don't want my, my songs, I want, a, I want a period during which you don't grant another mechanical license to another recording of this song, because I want my song out there alone, rec my recording out there alone for a period of time before you can start looking for cover versions. I don't want you to license my uh, songs for use in, in there used to be in the, in the 90s pre-Mandela's release that, that nobody ever wanted their songs to be used in conjunction with South African anything. There are writers who don't want their songs used in connection with tobacco products or alcohol products. Not that many, I have to say, since most of them smoke and drink. Um, and, and uh, there would be people like who, who would take an, a view like, I don't want my songs used with X-rated movies. There were other writers, I represented one, who said, I actually want my songs used with X-rated music, but who knew, who knew what, where, where he was coming from? But there are a whole list of approvals that you want to put into an assignment. And they're negative approvals. You can't do the following things 
contractually, you can't do the following things without, with my songs unless you get my prior written permission. In a license, it's different. You only license the rights that you, the rights have to be enumerated. In an assignment, it's just, I assign you all my rights, but I, you require my permission for the following things. In a license, it says, I license you to do the following things. And if it doesn't say you, if the license doesn't say you, the publisher can do them, then the publisher can't do them. So you're still going to want to enumerate, but you enumerate rights in a different way. In the, in the, in the, li in the assignment way, it's a negative enumeration. You can't do the following things without my permission. In a license, you can only do the following things. And therefore, you don't put in the things that you don't want him to do. <coughs> Those approvals are very hard to get in a lot of cases. And a publisher will argue, <coughs> excuse me, the more you handcuff me from doing things, the less the income flow is going to be. So that you may be prepared for a lesser income flow because you're the writer and you cherish your rights, etc. But I'm a publisher. I'm in business. I'm paying money to you, and I want the the open ability to be able to go and exploit these any way I can. So there's always quite a fight going on when you're trying to limit the publisher's rights to do things. Accounting. There are some publishing companies who now account in a so-called transparent manner, which is that you can go online and you can see on a day-by-day -day basis how much money you're earning from a song. There's one company, as far as I can remember, that does that. Nobody's quite sure whether that company is going to stand the test of time. The other publishers do not do transparent accounting. They do paper accounting, and they generally do it twice a year. If you're, if you're pushy, you can get them to do it four times a year. Um, and they can do four times a year. A lot of them will say, we can't. We just, uh, we're not set up. Our databases don't work that way. Our, um, you know, our IT doesn't operate on a quarterly basis, but actually it can quite easily operate on a quarterly basis. And you should push for quarterly accounting. And what happens is that they close the accounting period. Uh, if it's a half year basis, they close it at the end of June and the end of December. And sometime within the next 90 days following the end of that half year, you get a royalty statement showing what has been received, from what, from which song, from which country, from what source, mechanical performance, blah, 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 blah. And, <coughs> and assuming that you've uh, recouped your advances, the royalty check that, that matches the royalty statement. Um, and you want it quarterly because you'd rather the money was in your bank than in theirs. And that's how they do 100% to nothing deals, incidentally, uh, for very, very famous songwriters. Because they, they only account a half yearly basis to those songwriters. And for a half year, they're holding the songwriters' money in their bank account and earning money out of the money that they're eventually going to have to recoup, uh, or rather pay over to the writer at six months later. Um, that sounds like it ought to be simple, but of course it isn't, because in the end, royalty income is coming in from all over the place. It's not just coming from the United Kingdom, it's coming in from France, it's coming in from Japan, it's coming in from, you know, all over the world. And there are, there are time lags between a, a song, uh, a, a, a recording bought in South Africa in January, of 2015, that money will, the, the royalty that the publisher is due will probably come to the publisher by the end of June, uh, because it will come from the, the, the collection society to the publisher, so the end of June. But let's say it's one day late and it's the 1st of July. Therefore, the publisher doesn't, who is the sub-publisher in South Africa, doesn't have to account to the publisher in the UK until the 90 days following the end of December, because the money came in the 1st of July. That's the period 1st of July to 31st of December. There's a 90-day delay. So the money comes actually from South Africa to the UK publisher 31st of March the following year. And then because that was received in, a, in the first six months, that doesn't need to be accounted until the end of the six months and 90 days. So you're probably not going to get that money until at least September of the following year. But that's how the royalty system flows uh, virtually everywhere. I don't love it, but it's reality. It's what actually happens. 
You also get the right in the accounting clause to audit the royalty statements, um, which is, a, which is a, a, a right you should exercise carefully, but you should exercise when appropriate. And the, royalty, and the audit clause should go on to say that if, the, if after audit it is found that the publisher has under-accounted by typically, let's say, 10%, then the publisher has to pay the costs of the audit and interest on the under-accounted money. Um, and it's a sort of penalty clause in a way, as it should be. They should get the royalty statements right. They shouldn't have, you shouldn't have to go in and audit them to get the rightful share that you're entitled to. But it happens. No, nobody has a public, perfect royalty accounting system. No, none of the big companies or any of the small companies have perfect accounting systems. They do the best they can. Sometimes the best of them do the best they can. The, the, less, the less good do the worst they can and hope that you never find out. Um, but if you've got the account, if you've got the audit right, you can go in. You can it costs a lot of money to hire an auditor, so don't do it willy nilly. But if it's very clear that you're getting a whole lot less money than you've expected, then you know go in and audit, and hopefully they'll find a ten percent discrepancy, and you slap the bill on the on the publisher for for doing the audit in the first place. There are after the audit uh, accounting clause all sorts of boilerplate clauses. These are fairly standard clauses, you know, which law, law of which country applies to this contract? The, you know, how do you serve a notice if you need to serve a notice? The, they're fairly what I call boilerplate clauses, most, con most contracts of all sorts, not just publishing contracts or music business contracts. Nearly all contracts contain this kind of boilerplate stuff. You know, and the right to suspend in the event of... Blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to go through that because it's bog, fairly bog-standard contract law. And I assume that at some point you're doing fairly bog standard contract law. Um, and if you are, then all of that, that, those boilerplate clauses will apply equally to c contracts like this. And it being 6.33, and Guy having hustled me to make sure I'm finished by 6.30, that's where I'm going to end it. I, I, I do appreciate that I'm probably left you with a whole bunch of questions that you would like to answer. And I'm very open to answering any question that I know the answer to. If you ask me questions I don't know the answer to, I'll start crying, so don't do that. Um, but I won't be able to do it this week because we've got to shoot off to this other thing. So we'll do an extended session next time, next week, this time next week, when we'll be doing recording contracts. But before I start on recording contracts, I'll allow a 20, 25 minute Q&A period in case people have got questions from today. And if you have, write them down, because if you've got a me memory anything like mine, you'll have forgotten them by next week. And I'll have All forgotten the answers. Until next week. And that's a brilliant part watching Doctor Who. They draw you in for next week's episode. Robert's <laughs> <laughs> drawn you in to come next week. Thank you very much, Robert. Fantastic as always. See you all next week. Hope you signed up. Hope you enjoyed it tonight. And as Robert says, apologies for the truncated nature of today. We'll have time next week to... It's actually a perfect bridge between publishing and recording contracts. We can link into, I think. Okay. So, thank you, Robert.